Okay, uh, this is Civil Procedure Review, uh, Spring of 2015. I'm going to do this review in multiple parts. Um, the first part is going to be a, a brief discussion of the exam itself, as well as uh, uh, the first topic that we cover this semester, which is uh, pleadings. Uh, regarding the exam itself, it's going to be four hours long. I'm going to write it as a three and a half hour exam. It'll be multiple choice. There's also going to be one or more essay questions. Um, you are permitted to use laptops. The exam is a, a, a closed book. A laptops will have to use Scantron. Um, you can also handwrite the exam if you wish. Um, you can do the exam in any order you want. You can start with the multiples or start with the essays or bounce back and forth. I just admonish you to use your time uh, wisely. I've prepared a statutory supplement that contains um, all of the federal rules of civil procedure, um, statutes, constitutional provisions, and other materials we've discussed or, or that were assigned um, this year. It's quite lengthy, um, so it should cover uh, everything that you need. All right, now let's move into the first uh, topic for today, which is going to be uh, pleadings. Now you see on the left of the hand, right hand, I have uh, displays, but I'm not going to have those in the middle because I want to be able to use the chalkboard. Now the first thing we covered in the spring was pleadings, and that actually was um, carryover from the fall. So in the fall we started with pleadings. I'll remind you about the, no, I want the lights on, please. Yeah, otherwise the video's not going to look good. All right, thank you. Remind you of the rules mnemonics, which help you to remember how some of these work, uh, such as rule eight. It used to be K-I-S-S, keep it simple. Uh, now it's probably show me the money under twip ball, uh, 9B2, uh, heightened cleaning standards for fraud, give me more rule, and so on and so forth. Now, first, don't forget about Rule 7. Rule 7 makes a distinction between pleadings and motions. Under Rule 7a, there's only a few kind of pleadings that fall into just four categories. There are the categories of complaints, answers, and the reply. If reply is only permitted if the court orders it, it doesn't happen all that often. For complaints, we have a regular complaint, a third party complaint. For answers, we have the answer to a complaint, an answer to a counterclaim, an answer to a cross claim, an answer to a third party claim. All right, we don't have any other kinds of pleadings. Now for any paper that's filed in court, we have Rule 11. Rule 11 has applicability across a lot of procedure, with the exception of discovery, because for discovery we have rules 26G and rule 37. There are special sanctions rules just for discovery. Regarding rule 11, rule 11A is your requirement to do certification. When you sign something, you're certifying that you, among other things, conducted an investigation into the facts and the law, it's reasonable under the circumstances, you're certifying that the uh, uh, facts asserted in the paper or the pleading are well-based in your uh, investigation, um, that regarding your legal arguments, that they're based in existing law, or for a non-frivolous argument for the extension, reversal, modification, or establishment um, of the law. If you sign a paper, okay, and present it to the court, and you violated your certification, for example, you didn't engage in a reasonable investigation, or you filed a paper with improper purpose and the like, remember the cases we discussed, then under 11C you can be sanctioned, right? Sanctions can't be punitive, instead they're to be proportional uh, to the offense, they're intended to uh, prevent similar conduct by the uh, uh, offending uh, uh, person or by others, um, such sanctions can include money uh, in many cases, uh, unless it's, the sanction is for uh, a client for the violation of um, the portion of the weapon B that goes towards the law. In that case, the representative party's lawyer is the one who can sanction for money, but not for representing client. Go back to the uh, hypos we did in class. Now I want to move into something a little bit more meaty. 
which are the standards for pleadings. Under Rule 8A, and maybe particularly 8A. Alright, 8A, particularly 8A2, and 12B6, as we said in class, are like twins. 8A2 requires that a party stating the claim must state in short and plain terms their claim showing entitlement to relief. Failure to do so entitles a defending party to seek dismissal of the claim under 12b-6 for failure to state a claim. Now, if somebody's moving for relief under Rule 12b-6, then the basis is, is generally going to be either legal insufficiency or factual insufficiency. Now, legal insufficiency would be like um, the hypo we did in the first day of class, right? P. Sue's deep for willful failure to invite to a birthday party. Even if all those facts are true, even if there's lots and lots of facts in the complaint, the law simply does not provide a recovery for willful failure to invite. In such a case, the deficiency is not one of factual insufficiency, but rather one of legal insufficiency, and a 12 v 6 motion ought to be granted. Uh, the more interesting cases, of course, are the ones that are like Iqbal and uh, Twombly, the one where the problem is a lot legal insufficiency, uh, but factual insufficiency. And when you're analyzing the case involving factual insufficiency, you need to consider the multiple steps of the Connolly Iqbal analysis. Part of Connolly is the law. That first part is Connolly's requirement that any complaint stating the claim provide FA, fair notice to the defending party. Fair notice means that the claim has sufficient information. The defending party knows what they're being sued for so that they can start preparing defense. All right. The second part is Iqbal and Conley, which we've also called Twitball, and that's our so-called plausibility analysis. Now, in plausibility analysis, it's not enough for your claim to be possible. Instead, it has to be plausible. Well, what are the steps involved in that? The first one is to separate well-pleaded facts from legal conclusions. Now, the line between fact and legal conclusion is not particularly clear. We discussed that in class. I'll refer you back to your notes into our discussion. But generally speaking, identify things that are facts. And if things are not clearly fact or legal conclusion, then be prepared to argue both ways. So this first step under 2, we call it 2A, Separate facts from legal conclusions, all right? And that's a filtering function. We're ferreting out legal conclusions. Now, what might be legal conclusions? All right, think of things that are rote statements of a cause of action that we typically expect to be stated in any complaint leading that cause of action. For example, suppose P is suing D for, um, for a battery. And the plaintiff states in the complaint the defendant intentionally caused an offensive contact with me. Am I missing any elements there? And it happened? I said the defendant intentionally caused physical conduct contact with me. And it all happened. Right? Yeah. All right, that, that's all right out of what? Your statement, right? Or out of your, your horn book. All right, the court's probably going to throw all that stuff out. I know there's other elements. It could be offensive or what's offensive or harmful contact, right? All right. Defendant intentionally caused an offensive and harmful contact to me, right? The court's going to likely knock all that stuff out. <coughs> Excuse me. And say, no, no, you, you have to show more. All right. So separate the facts from legal conclusions. Uh, the second step is to ask whether uh, the claim is plausible. All right, and in doing that, you have to separate, excuse me, and, and asking if the claim is plausible, you're using the remaining facts, all right? Just the facts, just the facts. And you use so-called judicial experience and common sense, all right? What does that mean? It means you've got to use your BS detectors. Based on these facts, well, what's more believable, liability or non-liability, right? Okay. 
And what needs to be shown is plausibility, which is not possibility, not probability, but rather plausibility. And these aren't bright lines here. All right? Possibility is the lowest showing. Possibility is the old, commonly uh, no set of facts standard, which was thrown out by uh, Twomley. There's some fuzzy line between possible and plausible. And another fuzzy line goes up to probable. Well, these are about as fishy and squishy as terms can get in the law. All right? But think of it in terms of believability. Things that are possible are things, well, it could be. Don't know if I buy it, but it could happen, right? Plausibility. Oh, I find that to be sufficiently believable, right? Probability. Oh, yeah, that, that's what happened. That's what happened, OK? Think of it in that way. Plausibility means believable enough. And what, what do I mean by believable enough? I mean something like this. A real twit ball fact pattern is going to come up when there's a hole in the facts, right? Think of a fall exam, remember? Um, or think, think rather even better than the Stewie hypotheticals, right? Stewie and Meg and all of that. There's an allegation that uh, uh, Brian owns a blue Prius. And the plaintiff, Meg, was hit by a blue Prius because she didn't see who was driving. And therefore, it's Brian who was negligent, right? Well, we're missing an allegation here, right? That it was Brian who was driving the blue Prius that hit uh, Meg. All right? So it's a football uh, fact patterns are going to occur when you have a, uh, a hole in facts, right? All right, yeah, that's what's, what's more believable, right? Liability or no liability? That's what I think the Iqbal and, and Twombly courts are really getting at. Which is more believable? When there's a hole in facts and you're making an inference based on the facts given, which inference is more likely? So what facts do we have here? We have that, oh, Brian drives a blue Prius, Meg was hit by a blue Prius, okay, and that's it. Those are the facts. Well, two inferences you make from that. The blue Prius that hit Meg was driven by Brian, or the blue Prius driven, that they hit Meg was driven by somebody else, right? Which one's more likely, right? Probably the one of no liability, because there's lots and lots and lots of blue Priuses out there, all right? Bless you. So that's what you want to do with the uh, Iqbal uh, analysis. Now remember, there's more to pleading a uh, claim than just Iqbal. Um, for instance, Rule 9 has a bunch of special pleading circumstances. Okay. And one we focused on in class particularly was Rule 9 made, right? Which says the circumstances of fraud or mistake. Uh, must be uh, pleaded with uh, particularity, but states of knowledge such as knowledge, uh, malice, uh, intent uh, may be pleaded uh, generally. Okay, we have the materials in the book for that, so I will relate to that. Now, let's move into the defendant's options. All right. Plaintiff is sued, defendant, defendant has been served. Defendant has three options. Default, pre-answer motion, um, or answer. Well, let's take these in turn. Default's <coughs> covered by Rule 55, okay? Rule 55 has two significant parts that you have to keep distinct. 55A is the entry of default. That's what happens when somebody hasn't defended, they haven't answered, okay? 55A, entry of default, can even be done by the clerk once it's brought to her or his attention, okay? Entry of default doesn't mean the, the claimant wins. It simply means the defendant hasn't responded. It's akin to treating as admitted all of the well-pleaded facts alleged in the complaint, all right? Remember, what happens if you answer a complaint, but you don't admit or deny? What happens? It's admitted, right? 
except regarding the amount of damages. It's all admitted. Well, it's akin to the same thing in, in an entry of default. You haven't answered, so we're going to treat all the, the well-pleaded facts as, as being admitted. It's true, right? Now, if the uh, claimant here wants relief, um, 55A is not enough. They've got to seek relief under 55B, default judgment. It's the judgment that gets you the relief. And here the court has um, uh, a good bit of discretion. The court can permit uh, a hearing, can permit the entry of evidence, and so on and so forth. In fact, in some cases, uh, a litigant will uh, intentionally choose to, uh, to default under 55A, but then show up and fight the amount of damages under uh, 55B. And remember, again, you know, the amount of damages is not admitted by failure to uh, deny. All right. Pre-answer motion under Rule 12. All right. Rule 12 is, is labyrinthian. Rule 12 is important. Rule 12 ties together a number of, of, of other important things we studied in the fall as well as in the spring. Um, there's a number of Rule 12 motions. We'll talk about Rule 12b in a minute, uh, but don't forget to talk about to think about Rules uh, 12e and uh, 12f. Uh, rule 12e is a, a motion, a pre-answer motion for more definite statement, right? For instance, P sues D and P says. You were bad and you caused me harm, right? Well, what does that mean, right? It's so vague and ambiguous, the defendant is not able to formulate a response. So the defendant moves uh, for a more definite uh, statement. Another pre answer motion is the 12F uh, motion to strike, right? A 12F motion to strike serves a number of functions. One is to get rid of a uh, material that's scandalous, you know, accusing someone. Of, of being a, 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 a cheater in, say, like a car accident. And they cheat on their spouse. And they smell bad. And what else? And, and they, they kick little animals when no one's looking. Um, scandalous material is not uh, relevant to uh, blank, which is for a car accident. All right, a 12F uh, motion to strike would be uh, appropriate because the uh, material uh, being uh, stricken would be uh, impertinent, scandalous, or immaterial. Don't forget that another basis for a motion to strike is to um, obtain a striking of a legally insufficient defense. All right, think about it. How do we get rid of a legally or factually insufficient claim? We move under Rule 12b6, right? Well, what about a legally insufficient uh, defense? For example, you're beat up by a police officer, and the police officer uh, answers by saying, I assert the affirmative defense that I'm a cop and I can do anything I want. Right? Well, that's not a, a lawful defense, it's not a legal defense. So the proper motion here is not a 12b6, because 12b6 gets rid of bad claims. This is a bad defense. So you use a, a 12f motion to strike. Now, the more interesting motions under a 12b. Uh, are asserting by pre-answer motion um, any of the uh, defenses listed in Rule 12b. Now, let's divvy these motions up once again by the type of motion. We have this favor. Favor. And uh, most favored. Uh, disfavored defenses are 12b2, a PJ, right? 12b3, lack of venue. 12b4 and 5, right? Improper process and improper service of process. All right. And again, what's the difference between improper process and improper service of process? Um, improper process, there, there's a, a defect um, in the papers on themselves. Remember, when you, you serve somebody under Rule 4, you have to give them not just a complaint, Complaint has to be uh, stamped with a, uh, a civil action number issued by the, uh, the clerk, but also you have to serve a copy of the summons. And the summons is the uh, document by which the court actually asserts its power over you. It's the summons being served on you with a complaint that establishes personal jurisdiction. It's the legal modern day equivalent of the uh, uh, ancient uh, copious ad respondendum by which the, uh, uh, the judge, not the judge, the, the sheriff would come and drag you to the court. All right. Well, these defenses here are disfavored. 
which means they're going to fall under the initial response rule. All right. Now, I'll get to the initial response rule in a minute. The basic gist of it is, if you don't assert it in the right way, and right away, with a big exception, it's going to be waived forever. All right. So his favorite defenses are waivable. The favorite defenses are 12 v. 6, a failure to state a claim. Um, uh, 12 v. 7, a failure to join a Rule 19 party. Okay. Um, as well as a motion to strike uh, a legally insufficient defense. Okay. These can be raised through trial. You shouldn't be asserting these for the first time on appeal. The appellate court will probably say you waived that defense, but they can be raised through trial. Uh, the most favored defense is lack of subject matter jurisdiction, uh, Rule 12b1. Uh, that can be raised at any time, not just through trial, but also on appeal. And by appeal, we mean on direct appeal, right? On direct appeal, not collaterally, on direct appeal. And it's so important that even if the parties don't raise it, the court must uh, raise it um, itself. Now, with pre-answer motions, what you're supposed to do is consolidate all of your pre-answer motions together in one pre-answer motion. And you need to assert any of the defenses that are available to you at that time. Okay? So typically, you're going to be able to assert all of these with your pre answer motion because any defect in the papers or service of process, the manner of service, right, you're going to know from what happened when the papers were served. Any problem with PJ or venue, you should be able to answer from the nature of the papers that were served upon you. Failure to state a claim, you should be able to tell by looking at the papers and so on and so on and so forth. Now, you can only make one pre-answer motion. And you think, well, ha, huh, professor, you just said that these, the favorite defenses, can be raised through trial, and this, most favored, can be raised even on appeal. So why are you saying you can make only one pre-answer motion? And the answer to this is that these can still be raised after the pre-answer motion, but you can only make one pre-answer motion, all right? If you make the pre-answer motion, all right, then you shouldn't be making another one. And if you want to raise these defenses later on, you're going to assert it later on in your answer, in a post-answer motion or the like, okay? The reason we don't want multiple pre-answer motions is because courts don't want to be deciding things pre-piecemeal, being that all of these are typically going to be available to you at the time you answer your uh, complaint or at the time you file that one pre-answer motion, we want you to assert them all at once. Now note that I said that these defenses are going to be, quote, available to you, right? Now sometimes it's going to be the case that one of the 12B motions won't be available to you at the time that you make an earlier motion, right? So say for instance, say for instance, you make a pre-answer motion and the defendant makes an amended complaint, all right? that adds an additional claim that now gives rise to some sort of jurisdictional issue perhaps, or maybe a Rule 19 issue. In a case where the basis for the, the Rule 19, or the basis for the pre-answer motion was not available to you when you made the first motion, all right, and later that basis comes available to you, then you can still make a second pre-answer motion. The circumstance is going to be pretty rare. All right. Now, let's talk about the answer, and then we'll tie that into the initial response rule as well.
You can also assert defenses. And those defenses can include Rule 12B defenses, but they can include Rule 8C defenses. Or I think Rule 8B defenses are the ones we just talked about. 8C defenses are a non-exclusive laundry list, which include lots of things, right? Waiver, res judicata, uh, license, uh, contributory negligence. Uh, even though comparative negligence isn't listed there, that counts because it's a non-exclusive list. All right, 8C defenses can be asserted. As can other claims. Counterclaims and cross claims can go in the answer. Now you remember I said a moment ago that I get back to uh, the initial response rule, so let's do that now. All right, the initial response rule applies not to 8C defenses, but rather to rule uh, 12C, to rule 12B defenses. All right, and that's going to be the case whether you're uh, serving an answer or a pre-answer motion. What the initial response rule essentially means is whatever your initial response is, you are going to waive disfavored defenses forever unless you include them in your initial response. Whether your initial response is a pre-answer motion or an answer, doesn't matter. There's an exception, but we're going to start off with the rule and I'll give you the exception. The general rule is, whatever your initial response is, if you fail to include a disfavored defense, that's will be two, three, four, or five, gone forever. Which makes sense, these are personal defenses. Use them or lose them, as the saying goes. Now, there's an exception to the initial response rule. An exception kicks in if and only if your initial response is by way of answer. If your initial response is an answer, and you omit a uh, disfavored defense, say for example, PJ, say you assert venue, but guess what, you forget PJ. Well, don't forget. An amendment is a matter of course. An amendment as a matter of course is a one-time do-over, a mulligan, an absolute right belonging to a pleader to do, have a do-over, all right? Look at Rule 15A for the timing. Here's just one of the examples of the timing. If the defendant serves its answer on day one, then it may serve an amended pleading one time only, up to 21 days after the service of the first of the answer. What does that mean? That means the defendant serves an answer including the, the defense of no venue, and like, oops, forgot to include no PJ, then the defendant can include PJ in an amended answer. So 10 days later, the defendant serves an amended answer, adding no PJ. We're okay, all right. Now, what if two days later, the defendant wants to amend a second time, right? To add lack of uh, improper service of process, right? Well, see, we said first day, 10th day, and 12th day. This is the normal answer, right? This is the original answer. This one here was the amendment as a matter of course. This one is going to have to be by leave of court. How many amendments do you get as a matter of course? How many? Just one. Very good. So this one's got to be by leave of court. And say the court grants leave right away. Well, we're still under 21 days, right? Too bad, so sad. You can only rescue that disfavored defense in this scenario if that amendment is one as a matter of course. So to summarize, initial response rule. Disfavored defenses, use them or lose them. Put them in your initial response or they're gone forever, with one exception. Your initial response is an answer, and you add the omitted disfavored defense as an amendment as a matter of course. Okay. Alrighty. Now let's move back into the mechanics of answering over here. This stuff I'm gonna delete. We've covered this. Counterclaims and cross claims, we get to enjoin her. So now we're admit, deny, deep deny. Well, <laughs> and now we're in the territory of Rule 8B, right? 
right? So you've been accused of something, now you have to admit, deny, do a deep denial, so on and so forth. Um, if you don't deny something, then you are admitting it with the exception of the amount of damages. All right, well then, how do you deny? Well, the rule tells us you can do, at least in theory, a general denial. I deny everything. But how often? Or is that going to be the case? How often are you going to be able to do that? Like, almost never, right? They got your name right, you know, or where you live right. We're going to have to admit that. So chances are what you'll actually do is go paragraph by paragraph, admit, deny, and the like. Now here, I would refer you for purposes of study back to the, what was the blue wheelbarrow hypothetical? Do you guys recall that? The wheelbarrow? We did that. What's that? Oh, the Mazda? Uh, and tell them that I'm teaching a class right now. We'll go and take the Sorry, hold on. I don't know why my computer's green. Oh, your computer's green? Oh, I can tell you exactly why, Sylvia. Why? That happens because you're, what do you have, a Mac? Yeah. Yes, this has happened to me before in class as well. But the, the, the Apple products will say to each other, so even, if your phone, even though your phone is turned out, it starts to ring on your, your Macintosh. So just uh, mute the volume on your Mac and you'll be fine. You're welcome. But again, I, I can't talk to them right now. All right. I have no idea what I was just talking about. The wheelbarrow. Uh, oh, the Mazda? All right. Whatever hypothetical I used in class, right? You know, that the car was this color, but not that color, and this, that, and the other, right? Okay, oh, wait, you're, 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 you're answering a pleading. You gotta make sure that you're denying everything that is deniable, right? So, my general advice to you is to admit specifically and deny generally, right? The rule permits you to do it both ways. You can admit specifically and deny generally, or you can deny specifically and admit generally, all right? The problem with that is, if you admit generally, say, I deny A, B, and C, and admit everything else. Well, maybe you should have denied D, E, and F, but you forgot you weren't paying close enough attention, right? So it's better to only admit to the things that you're admitting to. I admit to X, Y, Z, and deny the rest of paragraph five, all right? You can do stuff like that. If you lack knowledge or information sufficient to form a belief, then you can do the deemed denial. And you have to use the magic language that's in rule A, B, five, right? Uh, I don't have the rule in front of me right now. You can look up, why don't you look up, make sure I'm not mistaken. Something like, uh, uh, the, the defendant lacks knowledge, knowledge and information sufficient to form a belief. Am I right? Rule 8B5? Yeah. No, lacks knowledge and information, right? Or knowledge or, lacks knowledge or information sufficient, sufficient to form a belief. And that will be treated as a denial. Now, a deep denial is not a magic uh, hammer. It's not Fuller's magic hammer that you can just bring out. It's like, well, I don't really know what the truth is. I'm looking at looking. Ah, uh because -uh. under Rule 8, uh, under Rule 11, right? Under Rule 11B, you have that duty to make a reasonable investigation of the facts before you serve your answer. So when you say that I lack knowledge or information, it's, it's sufficient to, uh, knowledge or information is sufficient to form a belief and then you sign it, you file it, you're certifying that you, you made that reasonable um, requirement. And when you say knowledge, that's like what's in your head, right? But information doesn't mean it's in your head. It might be information that's available to you, right? It's within your grasp, it's on your computer. You know who to talk to to get it, right? It's in your file cabinet, it's in your files, whatever. You can talk to your doctor or your, your whoever to get that information. We have that duty to get that stuff. So you can't just say, as a magical incantation, the deemed denial. In fact, there's been cases where a uh, defendant has asserted the deemed denial, even though they actually had the information within their grasp. Then the court said, guess what? The deemed denial is stricken, and now we're treating your deemed denial as it's gone. And since there's no uh, answer to that allegation, you're deemed to have admitted it, right? So don't do a deemed denial unless you actually can. All right. All right, I think that takes us up to amendments. And I'm sure all of you are just chomping in the bit to talk about uh, relation back. All right. Amendments. 
the new amendment as a matter of course. Uh, we basically already talked about that, right? It's a one time as a matter of right mulligan, a do over. You can do it by consent of the other parties. Or you can do it by LOC leave of um, board. Well, regarding um, a, 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 an amendment uh, by consent, um, I, I uh, don't, don't assume that's never done, right? Because oftentimes lawyers might just consent to an amendment knowing that, that why should they put up a fuss? If we have to go to the court, the court's likely to grant it anyway if it's early in the litigation. So why be a jerk and piss off the judge? All right, well, let's say, matter of course, it's too late. Can't get consent, then you can go and ask uh, the court. Well, that's fine. Well, now it's a motion, right? Court has to decide. Well, the rule is tilted towards granting the motion, right? A, uh, a leave to amend will be granted freely as long as justice requires it, right? Well, the court is going to be inclined to grant the motion unless justice doesn't require it, right? And that might be because considerations undo delay by the moment. Right? Or prejudice to the non moving party, right? Or futility. The amendment would be futile. For example, I sue the defendant for uh, uh, failure to invite me to the birthday party. Um, the court dismisses it. I move for amend to amend, uh, to change it to uh, malicious failure to invite. Well, the court on to deny my motion because amendment would be futile because I still wouldn't stay to collect. Another reason why court might deny leave to amend as being futile is because the amendment would state a claim that is untimely. It's barred by the statute of limitations and it wouldn't relate back. All right? But keep in mind that 15A does not equal 15C, all right? So this is a nice little segue to our discussion on relation back. 15A, and here I'm talking about a motion, uh, a motion for leave to amend uh, under Rule 15A. 15A, motion to amend, is at the discretion of the court. It's up to the court whether or not to grant leave to amend. All right. Fifteen C relation back. There's no discretion at all. Rule fifteen C relation back is asks: Are the elements of relation back met? Yes or no? All right. Now I know that there's some squishy elements within the rule itself, right? I'm not suggesting that it's, it's actually a rule. There are standardish aspects to Rule 15C. However, once the court has gone through all of those elements and done the analysis, it's a yes or no, up or down question. The court does not say, well, the complaint would, the amendment complaint would relate back, but I would exercise my discretion not to allow relation back. Courts can't do that. Right? Back. Justice Sotomayor points that out to us in Krupski. The question of whether to amend is at the court's discretion. It's a leave to amend motion. But once that motion has been granted, the question of relation back is a binary in the sense it's yes or no. If the elements are met, that amendment relates back. Okay? So if I test you on relation back, I don't want to see anybody confusing 15A with 15C. The closest you can say that they relate to each other is that lack of relation back could mean futility, which might prompt the judge not to grant the amendment in the first place. Okay. Let's move into relation back itself. Uh, I recommend you open your rule books to see. C 
has three different bases in relation back. C1A, C1B, then C1C. I have never, ever, ever tested on C1A. Ever. I'm not saying I never would. All right? I do leave that option open. But C1A is only implicated if there's a state law that addresses relation back of a state claim. Now here I guide you to Glanon. Glanon has a nice little note discussing the function of C1A. Look at the case book on the materials on relation back. The C1A says the law that provides the applicable statute of limitations allows relation back. That's not going to be raised unless the facts tell you of some sort of statute of limitations that provides not just this limitations period, but also the mechanics by which mechanic by which I'll start that sentence again. 15C1A is only implicated if you have a law that not only provides applicable statute of limitations, but additionally states the mechanics under which relation back can happen. Okay? Now, if I give you a fact pattern that raises that, all right, that by all means discuss 15C1. A. And 15C1B, 15C1C are federal bases for relation back. Remember how in a lot of our federal rules, the federal law would say, oh, use the state law, and if the state law doesn't work, use the federal law. Like, for example, the manners of service under Rule 40, right? Under Rule 40, the service that summons a complaint can be either under the federal basis, which is personal service, or leaving it at their usual place of abode with a person of appropriate age and discretion, right? That is the federal basis. But Rule 40 also says you can also use whatever the state law provides, right? Well, 15C1A is kind of like that. If the state law provides statute of limitations and a relation back rule, then we can use the state law, right? 15C1B and C are the federal basis for relation back. The relation back is going to be okay as long as any applicable basis is met. Now, I've never tested on C1A. Well, let's talk about C1B, one of the two federal bases. C1B is when you are changing a claim or a defense, all right, but not changing or adding parties, all right? Think of, for example, the case of the book, right? The guy that was injured playing basketball, and there was a claim for, I don't remember what, it was improper maintenance of the basketball court, or improper maintenance of the facilities. I obviously don't remember, right? And then later on, after the limitations period expired, there was a motion for leave to amend to add a claim for improper uh, care in the facility, right? Same plaintiff, same defendants, they added a claim, all right? C1B by itself is for changing the claim or defense or adding, right? Changing or adding, changing or adding the claim or defense, but not changing or adding the parties, all right? However, if we're changing or adding the parties, then our analysis is not C1B by itself. It's C1C. C1C, very testable, because it really requires you to think about how to organize an essay, how to make a rule statement, and how the parts of the rule fit together. And it's got a lot of some elements that are very rule-like and some elements that are very standardish. Now, C1C is when we're changing the party, <coughs> changing the name of the party. It's also when we're adding a party. Note that I put adding a party in brackets. Why? Because the text of 15C1C addresses changing the party or changing the name of a party. It doesn't say anything about adding a party. But one of the footnotes in Kropsky, don't remember which one, I think it's footnote three, maybe like footnote three, addresses adding of a party. So all of these are covered under Rule 15C1C. And in addition, 
It might be just the same claims. In other words, we're just asserting against these people the same claims were asserted before, or additional, right? Additional or different, right? So you could have the original suit is A versus B for negligence for a car wreck. And then later on, you add in C. So now it's A versus B and C for the same car wreck. We're not changing the claim, right? We're just adding a party. Or it might be A versus B, and then say A versus B for federal employment discrimination. And then you add in C, and it's versus C for state employment discrimination, right? So you have a slightly different claim against C, all right? Well, the key here is we're either changing the party, the name of the party, or adding the party, and it might or might not be the same claims being asserted against these people, or different, or additional, or what, all right? Let's think about what the elements are of relation back. I don't know if this is something left in here. It's yours, Keneally? What's the serial number? <laughs> what kind of guitar is it? It's a Gibson? No. Nope. Nope. All right. It's it's it, 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 it's a it's a nice it's a red one. It's a red guitar. All right. In the essay, if there is such an essay, I get the issue right. It's relation back. You know, not amendment. All right. Also, everybody's omitting the adding element. All right. Adding is is an element. Something that needs to be addressed. There's nothing in the rule that addresses adding. Make clear why adding is permitted, if that's the case. Now I'm going based upon what we've done in the practice essays, right? What, what we have in some of my past exams. I don't know what my actual exam is going to be. I don't know the essays. I'm not lying. This is true. All right? The next element, CTO, right? Are the claim or claims being asserted against this new person, whether it's a changed name, or change party or an added party, are the claims arising from the same conduct, transaction, or occurrence that were asserted or that were attempted to be asserted in the original pleading? All right, this is kindergarten, guys. You gotta play kindergarten. In kindergarten, we would play the game, is this thing like another thing, right? And you would have to compare and contrast, right? And CTO is the same thing. So here's the original claim, right? And here's the new claim. Um, for example, in the Peter Parker, I remember that one from Brittany's ALI, right? It's on the website. The original claim was against ABC for uh, negligent design and manufacturing the video game, against uh, Peter Parker for uh, battery, for throwing the video game controller, right? Well, the new claim is against XYZ for designing the graphics. In some ways, they're similar, right? Because they're all seeking relief for uh, Paul Pierce being bogged in the head, right? And in some ways, they're different, you know? Peter Parker's being sued for battery, for drug stuff, different action in a different place, a different time, right? ABC worked on the video game at different places and is, is being sued for, among other things, manufacturing the game, something XYZ didn't do. See how it's different acts at different places? XYZ, on the other hand, Design the graphics, all right? So you have to address both argument and counter argument. If there are differences between the claims and similarities between the claims, then you gotta make both sides arguments, right? Compare and contrast. Are they too similar, are they similar enough? Or are they too different? That's one way of looking at it. So then CTO. The next one is timing. All right. Remember, with relation back, we're going back to the future, really back to the past. The statute of limitations has expired. Complaint was filed. We have 120 day 4M period. And in just one of the examples I gave, the notes and knowledge were here, and the amended complaint was here. All right, regarding the timing, we use the 4M period. Now this is 
incorporation by reference. The actual format period on its face tells the plaintiff how long he or she has to serve the defendant. The original name defendant, a, a defendant. Somebody's being sued, you have 120 days to, to serve. By the way, in 2015, that's going to, down to 90 days, most likely. The federal, the Supreme Court just uh, yesterday, or the day before, uh, approved uh, all those changes to the FRCP that I've told you about. They will go into effect in December of 2015. Unless the uh, unless the U.S. Congress acts to change it, <coughs> Congress is not going to act to change it. Those changes are all going through. But you're being tested on the laws that exist today. 120 days. All right. So this period regarding form on its face means how long plaintiff has to serve the original name defendants here, right? But what Rule 15C1C does is incorporates that period regarding the notice of knowledge needed for relation back. All right? We have to be clear. This 120 days is measured from filing. And what has to happen within 120 days? The defendant has to, uh, the, the person to be added or the person to be changed, two things has to happen. Notice and knowledge. Both of these things, both of them have to happen within a 4M period, okay? Typically, they'll happen at the same time. They might happen at, at other times. It could happen. Now, first of all, what does that mean? That means there's one, two, three, four, five. Five elements that need to be discussed. Give me an overall rule statement that shows me that you know what the rule is and how the parts fit together, right? Make sure you understand that these two parts, those knowledge, fall under the timing. And by following the timing, I mean both of these puppies have to occur within 120 days as measured from the filing of the complaint. All right. And then separately, you need to analyze both of these. The note is such that there's no prejudice in defending on the merits. What does that mean? That means that the person being named in the amended complaint has gotten this notice of knowledge with sufficient time, they can start preparing the defense on the merits. It's able to preserve the, the evidence it needs to defend on the merits. It's able to find information and talk to people before it's too late, right? That's an element, right? That's a sub-element of, of number four. Not just that there's notice, but that notice avoids any prejudice in, in, in merits preparation. And finally, knowledge. The defendant could be brought in those or should have known. It would have been named in the original pleading BFM, but for a mistake. All right. Well, first, the knowledge. The knowledge that's relevant here, generally speaking, is the knowledge of the person being named or brought in, right? The new defendant. And that knowledge is that there was a mistake. Now, how do we define a mistake? You have to look at the case law. Okay, I've had several people in my office recently saying, I, I don't know what the definition of, of, of mistake is, and I remind them that the Krupski case law tells us what this definition is. You have to look to the case law. But that's always the case, right? You don't ever just start off with a fair language of a rule or a statute. Cases help to flesh it out. Krupski tells us um, the meaning of mistake. She looks to dictionary definitions. Look at those definitions, all right? She makes a distinction between a mistake and a deliberate choice, all right? And in making that distinction, she talks about the difference between, here, use the space over here. She talks about having knowledge she talks about a plaintiff having knowledge of the existence of a potential party versus fully understanding the role that party played in the underlying conduct. So for example, in Krupski, Mrs. Krupski either knew or should have known of the existence of, of, of Costa Crociere, all right? Because Costa Crociere was named, was named on the ticket. Existence, she should have known them, but 
she misunderstood the role that Costa Crociere played in the underlying uh, litigation, all right? Well, according to Krupski, even if you know the existence of a party, but you don't know the role, that counts as a uh, mistake, right? On the other hand, as Sotomayor points out, if a plaintiff knows of the existence of a party and fully understands the role played by that party, then that's not a mistake. That's a deliberate choice not to sue that person. Can you guys keep it down in the back, please? Keep it down in the back, because it's very distracting. Only know of the existence of a party and their role. Um, that's a deliberate choice. That doesn't count as a mistake at all. So even though Krupski tells us, oh, look just at the defendant's knowledge, well, to the extent that's true, we're looking at the defendant's knowledge of whether the plaintiff made a mistake. But asking whether the plaintiff made a mistake, we do have to ask whether it's a mistake or a deliberate choice, which comes to this um, right here. Now, something that's left kind of undecided by Krupski is, what if you have a case where the plaintiff doesn't know the role played by a potential defendant and didn't even know the existence of that potential defendant, right? And that's kind of like my, my hypo from last year with dog, rabbit, and turtle, right? Where turtle, and turtle made the food. You can go, go look at the old hypo. It's on the website, all right? Uh, dog didn't know the existence or the role played by turtle when uh, turtle cooked the hamburgers that might have made dogs sick, all right? Now, to address this one, I'm going to guide you back to the dictionary definitions that uh, so it's my work makes in the Krupski case, all right? Does she define mistakes so broadly that it might additionally include cases where the defendant, excuse me, where the, the, the plaintiff knew not of the role played by someone, nor did the plaintiff know the existence of that party um, whatsoever? Okay. The last thing I'll say about uh, relation back is um, don't forget the handout that I gave in class with the timing scenarios. I think those might be very um, helpful. Okay, now that wraps up pleadings. Why don't we take a five minute break? I'm going to stop the video camera and let's come back in here at 20 after 11. Then I'm going to start. But please be back here at 20 after to minimize the distractions once I start.